thank you everyone for the opportunity uh, to talk here. Uh, I've got multiple screens open, so if it feels like I'm not looking into the camera, it's because I'm looking at my presentation. Um, so excuse me for that. <laughs> uh, but yeah, uh, so today's talk is mostly a generalist introduction or take to how we, uh, well, first of all, what human-centered data science is or our imagination of what that is, number one. And number two, um, you know, how do we deploy it in practice? Because, you know, we, we've we talked about responsible data science and responsible AI ad nauseum for the past couple of years. It feels like every conference, workshop, seminar, colloquium that I go to, we talk about, well, how do we do AI responsibly? And there's a number of different uh, imaginations and lenses of inquiry through which various groups of people, including me, have been trying to look at it. Uh, but what does that mean in practice? Uh, that's always the question that I've tried to um, ask. So this particular talk is um, kind of sets up uh, my vision of what human-centered data science is, part of which can be found in our book. And then um, kind of talking about how through that particular lens of inquiry, I've been doing a series of um, research projects uh, that now encompasses a full research program uh, about algorithms in child welfare systems. So I am very interested in the idea of um, algorithms in the public sector, civic technology, public sector AI, so on and so forth. I think personally that a lot of attention uh, in the broader research community, be it in the uh, mainstream machine learning community or in adjacent communities like Sekai, um, we focused a lot on um, AI and machine learning from, you know, largely, you know, big technology companies and, you know, how, for instance, social media platforms reinforce uh, uh, you know, systems of inequalities and so on and so forth, and what kinds of uh, research researchers like us uh, should or should not be doing, so on and so forth. But I'm very interested in local governments. I'm very interested in what happens when, um, uh, you know, the average person off the street goes in to the government office to seek help from the lowest level bureaucrat. That's what I'm very interested in. How do algorithms affect that particular world? And what could we do to make it better? So in that particular vein, let me, okay. Uh, this is the outline of today's talk. So again, as I mentioned, I'll kind of set up the motivation, the research agenda and the idea of um, human-centered data science. Uh, I'll talk about three or four studies that we've done in the past few years that kind of exemplifies uh, this idea of the human-centered data science research framework. Um, there's obviously more to be done there. Uh, and so I'll talk a little bit about future directions, et cetera. Now, again, um, you know, I, I want to tell you all a story, right? Like, so that's why it's kind of a generalist talk. Uh, I'm, you know, if, if you want to dive deep into, into the weeds, uh, I'm happy to do that later. Um, but, you know, just wanted to kind of set that particular agenda. Uh, now, Speaking of motivation, you know, there, there's been a lot of um, newspaper articles and a lot of cognizance in the in the popular media around the world. I mean, this is not a North American phenomenon around the world uh, that we use algorithms in various parts of the public sector and we don't tend to do them very well. So, for instance, here's a NPR um, article about, you know, criminal justice over predictions, which is something that I think is in the popular consciousness right now. I think certainly criminal justice is something that lots of lots of people have uh, some cognizance of. But then again, you've, you know, you've got things like school segregation. And so uh, for a non North American audience, um, it might seem baffling, but mostly in the United States and certainly in parts of Canada, uh, what school your child goes to is determined by a variety of factors, including how much property tax you pay, 
And there's all, and, and, you know, there are, especially in the U.S., there are federal rules about school segregation and all that. So, you know, local bureaucrats and local uh, school systems uh, in San Francisco thought that, okay, well, you know, we're a technology savvy, progressive area. We're going to come up with an algorithm and where the algorithm is going to do this allocation problem, right? So you, you have a child and we know where you live. We know everything about you and your parents. Okay, well, what school do you go to? And it turns out that that didn't work very well. And then, of course, something that is close to my heart, this is um, uh, a, a series of articles and a nationwide campaign that has been started by the American Civil Liberties Union around algorithms in child welfare. Part of this algorithm, uh, part, I beg your pardon, part of uh, uh, kind of this work is in collaboration with folks there. Um, and algorithms in child welfare systems have also started to, I think, next to criminal justice, I think algorithms in child welfare is something that people have started talking about, thinking about a fair bit, right? So, so that's kind of like where our backdrop history motivation is. Um, and again, I'm very interested in the idea of local street level understandings and interactions, right? So to set my particular research agenda in stone, I am very interested in designing human-centered algorithms that empower stakeholders, support their decision-making processes, and improve the quality of human discretionary work. So in a sense, I want to help local bureaucrats and local people off the street who need help uh, in, in making the right types of decisions. Uh, do I critique algorithmic systems? Of course I do. I'm a huge critic of various kinds of algorithmic systems, but I don't just want to live in a, in a, in a critique only world, right? Like I also want to see, okay, what can we do consciously in a better way that empowers various types of people? Obviously we're not gonna solve structural inequalities with, uh, uh, with algorithms, but you know, can we make people's lives better in small ways? So uh, this is just a screenshot I pulled off Goodreads uh, for our book. Uh, so a few folks, uh, some of whose names might be familiar here, and I decided uh, a couple of years ago that, you know, we largely do the same things and we're going to these same conferences and we're going to these same workshops and we talk about the same things over and over again. And uh, why don't we kind of put this in, in practice? Uh, this book is a textbook for professional data scientists. So it's not an academic monograph. Uh, this is, we wanted to write a textbook where we said, okay, well, if you are a professional data scientist, if you work in this particular space and you are tasked with the authority to work on uh, these thorny problems, well, how do, you, how do you try and address a lot of these issues from a systematic um, kind of framework? That was really where we were wanting to get towards. And so let me kind of lay out very simplistically our idea of what the human-centered data science framework uh, is. So the first thing that we often kind of talk about, and again, none of this is particularly new or original, right? I mean, uh, we all stand on the shoulders of giants. So there's been a lot of people uh, in, in various research groups, countries, places all around the world who've talked about similar things. Uh, we've only tried to formalize some of the things that a lot of people talked about, right? And so the idea is that, okay, well, let's try to understand the socio-technical uh, system. Then let's try to intersperse human-centered design principles after we understand the socio-technical system to see, okay, what are the problems that could be solved should be solved, should not be solved, and, and what are the, the human-centered lenses? So for instance, if you think about human-centered design, there's a variety, and this, is, this list is not exhaustive, but there's a variety of ways in which you can think about human-centered design. Uh, there's theoretical design, which you know, talks about designing for particular theories, uh, especially in the public sector or in complex socio-technical environments. You know, Social scientists have done work on literally every single socio-technical system all around the world for a long, long time. So we have ideas about existing theories that we could kind of design the system through. And of course, a lot of people talk about participatory design, the idea that you, know, you need to kind of design with stakeholders. 
um, people who are going to deploy the system, people who are going to make decisions from the algorithms, and people whose lives are also going to be affected by this system in a variety of ways. So in the, in the public sector, that would be um, you know, the, the common person off the ground. Uh, then, of course, we have uh, things like speculative design, which is kind of um, counterfactual approaches. You know, a lot of people are very interested in and thinking about causality and, you know, different kind of out of the box lenses through which, you know, we might speculate what an alternative system might have been like so that, you know, we can get, you know, we can try and attempt to make this particular system better. So then the next step is actually the design and after we've designed the, the development process. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, and obviously, especially in the public sector, this is very important. Longitudinal field evaluations, which is you know, something that economists have been talking about for a really, really long time. Uh, but unfortunately, in computer science or in data science, you know, we, we always talk about moving fast and breaking things, which is the last thing that we want to be doing in these kinds of settings. So, uh, I'm sorry, I have a, okay, sorry, I have a, uh, like a drill file or fire alarm thing going on in the background. So if you hear stuff, I apologize. So, um, so we don't talk about longitudinal field evaluations a lot, right? Like we don't talk about the fact that we need to understand both short and long term downstream implications of um, you know, what we're designing and deploying. Because there's certain things that, that are emergent that we may not have thought about that possibly didn't come up through our understanding of the socio-technical system, right? So then thinking about all of these things, let's kind of Pivot to you know what is dear to my heart, which is algorithms and child welfare. So, the lot of fine folks have done excellent work, starting with possibly this paper uh, a few years ago uh, about algorithms in Allegheny County in Pittsburgh in Pennsylvania. This is a case study that a lot of people know, and um, this is this is a case study that a lot of people talk about particularly because uh, these kinds of um, algorithm, algorithmic implementation have been criticized by, by social scientists, notably in this particular case, uh, if you've ever read or, or heard of the book Automating Inequality by Virginia Eubanks, uh, this is the particular case study that she talks about. Uh, and you know, this is a screenshot taken directly from um, the, the white paper from, uh, from Allegheny County where you know, they're interested in all of these decision-making that, that kind of comes from human judgment, so on and so forth. Um, you know, and then obviously there have been uh, large scale kind of uh, media popularity around how these kind of fail, a variety of poor families, so on and so forth. Uh, and then uh, you could you could see that this is taken directly from Allegheny County that there's been, been pushback against the people who critique such systems that oh no your critiques are all unfounded and they're all really bad so on and so forth so you know these kinds of things happen I mean this is one particular um, case study uh, this is not uh, uh, you know meant to be super representative in general but as you know we decided that well. Uh, people have been talking about algorithms and child welfare in this particular context. Let's look at other contexts. Let's see what happens in other kind of contexts. So the first step that we wanted to make, and you know, I'll kind of relate this back to the to the overall framework of human-centered data science, but is well, let's try to understand the socio-technical systems. If algorithms are currently being used, and we kind of restricted the scope of this to the US, although the US is not the only place where algorithms exist in child welfare, uh, it, it exists in uh, both in many parts of Europe, as well as Canada, for sure, uh, that I do know. But the first step is let's try to understand the, the current state of the world. The second step is, well, how are these algorithms embedded Right, like it's not enough to say that. Well, here's an algorithm. Use it. The algorithm has to kind of be embedded in daily processes. Uh, and then the third is, well, how do we actually kind of do the data science work? 
that is required to improve these decision-making practices. Let me talk a little bit about ongoing work. So the first step is understanding the socio-technical systems. And again, you know, I'll kind of abstract this a little bit. This was a paper that was published in CHI 2020. Um, and so, you know, if you look at my facsimile of uh, a, a, the simplest equation of a straight line over here, you know, you'll see that generally speaking, if you wanted to think about uh, how, what kind of algorithms exist, well, we can kind of think about them from three different perspectives. Well, right. Well, there's, you know, what do algorithms actually predict? Then what kind of data do we actually kind of throw into these algorithms? And finally, what are the characteristics of that particular method itself, right? So input, output, and the method. And so we largely find, and these are screenshots taken from the paper, uh, uh, the, the, the citation is below, and I'm happy to post links, whatever. But you can see that algorithms in child welfare are not really a new phenomenon, but they've been they've existed for a while. But you can see with the general trend that they're starting to get more and more popular. And you can see, uh, I'll point out one thing, which is the, the red uh, marks over here. You can see there's an increase in popularity of risk assessment, right? So governments are super concerned about risk, risk to a child, so on and so forth. And later we'll see that none of this is actually measures risk to a child. They measure risk to a system, which are completely separate things. Uh, but there's been a, uh, the, the big takeaway from this is that in thinking about the outputs of algorithms that are designed, most of the time, these are like risk assessments, right? We're just trying to measure risk. And that's not a good thing for a variety of reasons we'll talk about. Um, we, we do a lot of risk assessment because it jives very well with traditional understandings of probability and it's kind of easy to make, like, you know, reduce the complex world into something reductive, like risk. Uh, the second thing is input. And this is something that gets a lot of attention in, um, you know, responsible AI. We always talk about our algorithms are bad because the data is bad. Well, that's not really, I mean, that's yes, but also. But here it's the data problem. And you see that. Uh, there's a lot of focus, once again, these red shades, these child risks and child needs, right? Like, ostensibly, this is all about the child, uh, but uh, it's very atheoretical because, you know, there's a lot of literature that suggests the welfare of a child is not actually about the child. It's about, it's about you know, the conditions around the child. It's more about the, the biological uh, parents, uh, uh, you know, systemic kind of conditions, so on and so forth. And the final thing, and this is something that annoys people a lot, but it's it's absolutely worth mentioning, but the choice of what method we use to kind of develop these algorithms is also very important. And uh, we see, uh, unsurprisingly, uh, that uh, there's, a, there's a growth in, in machine learning uh, over the years, uh, supervised machine learning to be specific as governments start uh, releasing more and more of their data uh, to their collaborators, both in academia or industry. Um, a lot of the times, uh, especially in North America, I actually don't know this about Europe, but in North America, a lot of the times what happens is that governments, local governments will contract with a private company. Most of the time, these are some nebulous third-party startups that have, uh, that have been created ostensibly for providing better algorithmic services. Um, I can tell you stories about those later and why they don't work. Uh, but uh, most of the times these are private contracts to um, small uh, private companies. Uh, however, we're starting to see uh, large big tech companies kind of entering the space as well because uh, this is a source of revenue. Governments uh, generally uh, throw a lot of money towards these things for political reasons, so on and so forth. So if you kind of abstract the big takeaways from this, you see that, well, we looked at what outputs these algorithms predict, what data goes into them and the choice of method. And it turns out that, you know, we there's three big takeaways. The first takeaway is that we need to develop algorithms that are more theoretical and context aware. Um, naively predicting risk to a child is useless. Like why do we why do we think that that is the most appropriate method? 
right? Uh, so, and the second point kind of leads off the first point, which is one of the reasons why the current state of the world is machine learning algorithms plus risk prediction is because uh, these algorithms are based on data that is readily available and easily quantifiable. So that is one of the problems that we need to think about in a responsible AI world. Just because the data exists doesn't mean it's the right kind of data. Um, and we see this particularly in child welfare where the data that are being used are the data that were collected. And the data that were collected were the data that was easily quantifiable, the data that was easily collectible. But that's not the right kind of data that we'll, that we'll soon see. And most importantly, the mission of child welfare systems is to improve the lives of children and not minimizing risk. So decentering improving lives and centering risk is a huge problem. It's a huge problem because then you're moving away from the core mission of child welfare systems. Child welfare systems are not about risk. Risk is one facet. Child welfare systems are about improving lives. So when you kind of live in a risk prediction world, you essentially live in a very scarcity, mindset, negative, deficit-based thinking, right? Like it's all about like, let's not do this because, oh no, risk. Whereas the conversation should be, what could we do so the children's lives are better? And it's, it's, a, it's, a, you know, it's definitely a divergent way of thinking, right? And so that kind of came out of that first kind of big study of, well, algorithms? in child welfare, what do they look like, right? And so that's kind of like that first step. Now, obviously based off some, some of this work and some of the collaborations we're do, we've done with ACLU, they kind of, uh, uh, they started thinking a lot about, um, uh, you know, the, the algorithms that, that exist. Uh, I am, you know, the, the, the framing here, family surveillance, uh, you know, it's, it's both true and false at the same time. Uh, there's there's other aspects to it. You can think about it as family surveillance, but you know, there's there's other ways that governments think about it. Uh, and so then this kind of le leads us to our second point, which is well, how are these algorithms embedded in the system. So we know what algorithms exist. Now the question is, how are they actually used for decision making? Where do they exist? And so um, oh, I forgot to mention this is again this is, was led by my graduate student Devon Saxena. It's won a best paper honorable award uh, at Kai 2020. Moving on uh, to our second piece. Uh, again, this was uh, a very careful, um, almost two year investigation. Uh, I was living in Wisconsin at that time. I've seen since moved to Toronto, but um, you know, the idea was let's really try to dive deep. Let's kind of shadow and follow and observe uh, the actual caseworkers and supervisors in child welfare systems to see how they use algorithms. Because as, as researchers or developers or data scientists, it's not just enough for me to say, okay, well, here's an algorithm, now use it. That has to be embedded in practice in the existing processes. And so we kind of did a lot of, you know, over a long period of time. And I wanted to present this figure to you, not for you to get overwhelmed, but this is a very simplified understanding of what child welfare a case looks like in child welfare. This is very simplified, by the way. This is, it's a lot more, actually a lot more complicated than that. But if you can kind of reduce it to a temporal flow, this is what it looks like. And in Wisconsin, we found, and I'll direct your attention to the text in the red boxes over here, that there are algorithms at various stages. It's not just like one algorithm. So our case study already differs from the Allegheny County uh, case study that people know. This Allegheny County case study was all about the piece over here in the screening hotline. Uh, you know, risk assessment algorithm is used during screening. So what we were interested in is, okay, well, screening is one thing, and the fine folks of CMU have done excellent work looking at that step, like when a case is coming into the system. My concern was, well, once it's in the system, what happens? And it turns out, if you look at the other red boxes over here, there's a, it's not one algorithm. There's a variety of algorithms that are actually used at various steps, right? And so while we did exhaustive work, one limitation I want to point out is that we never actually engaged with the court system at all, because that's a 
completely different cup of tea. And the, the blue boxes over here is actually the interactions that the legal system has with this uh, child welfare system, which is, again, opens up a huge can of worms. We were looking at the day-to-day -day practices of uh, the caseworkers, and we found largely, again, this is in Wisconsin, there were four algorithms. These are the names, CAN, 7EI, LPS, AST, used for a variety of different purposes. It's not one purpose, but a variety of different purposes. And they were used, as you can see, in these processes. Now, um, again, uh, these, this is just to highlight what they do. There's a variety of objectives for each of these algorithms that, that, you, can, that you can see. Uh, and the second thing that I want to point out is that algorithmic decisions are not done by one person in child welfare. In fact, it's an entire team. This team is very heterogeneous. There's a variety of different kind of roles in this team. I wanted to show you this to, to kind of nudge you to think that oftentimes when we build algorithms, however responsibly we might think, they're used by people. And if they're not used by one people, it's actually a group decision-making, group and collaborative decision-making effort, right? So big takeaways from this study, again, I'll, I'll throw a link in chat whenever, if people are interested. It is fascinating. We found a lot of really interesting things. But big takeaways, uh, the current predictors outcomes methods are not appropriate for improving outcomes for these families. They just, just aren't, like we've seen enough examples of this. Most importantly, data is intentionally biased and co-opted by caseworkers and foster parents. This was a big found finding that we saw. So the caseworkers and the foster parents may not know anything about math. They're not as, as good as you. But they have lived experience. They have heuristics. They know that, you know, the caseworkers know that the, the data that they collect kind of goes into a big machine somewhere. And through lived experience, they have seen that based on what the data output is, certain things happen to children. Because, you know, these caseworkers see different kinds of children and sometimes for a long period of time. So they have a lot of lived experience uh, about, you know, what happens to these kids. And so what they do is they intentionally bias the data. They've completely co-opted the game. This, this, this data is unreliable. This quantitative data that is collected, once again, let me repeat myself, is unreliable. You cannot build any algorithms. And if this is true in Wisconsin, which is a very um, average state in the US, it's true everywhere else. Data that's built using these kind of quantitative data that are collected at periods of time, completely unreliable because they're intentionally biased. And they're biased, not because the caseworkers are trying to do a bad thing. And let me give you an example how. The state pays a certain amount of money per child per day, okay? That is a pittance. It is not enough for any services for the child. Uh, so the caseworkers know that if they actually kind of collect data that intentionally says all of these children are extremely bad, based on that extremely bad uh, kind of data that's you know, the perception that's being fed into the algorithm, the state will actually provide more money for the child per day. And that money can be used by the caseworkers uh, for mental health services or even for small things. Again, a lot of social work literature has found that, okay, you might, you might be a downtrodden child in foster care, but you know, sometimes small things are very important. So like, you know, taking the child uh, to the museum or to uh, to the movies or to the circus or whatever is very important. And these are small things that the, the state never cares about and there's no money for it otherwise. And so the caseworkers are trying to save the children. So they've figured out that if they input data in a certain way, uh, that results in more money coming downstream. Because one of the big takeaways is that one of these algorithms is used to kind of set the rates for a child when they were never supposed to. They're never supposed to set rates. They're supposed to measure risk. Well, now you're setting rates with them. So the, the objective is shifted down the line. Um, the other thing is there's a lot of frustration, right? Like they think that their expertise is not being valued, which is true, right? It, uh, but they, are, they have legal mandates to use these algorithms. So again, it's, it's creating a lot of burdens on them. Uh, and again, they they know the biases in decision making. It's not as if you know the people who actually work with these algorithms are are, are simpletons who do not believe or do not know 
uh, about these biases. They absolutely know that these biases exist. So kind of taking all of this into account, we kind of created a, a decision-making framework for the public sector. Now I'm going to abstract this a little bit, but essentially there are three main uh, dimensions to algorithmic decision-making in the public sector. The number one thing is bureaucratic processes. So all algorithmic decisions uh, kind of are filtered through the existing processes. No bureaucrat is going to change their process because al algorithm demands it. It just doesn't happen. The second thing is human discretion. Choosing, uh, you know, having leeway and flexibility and choosing when and when not to apply algorithmic outcomes is a very, very important point. Discretion is a huge part of decision-making, algorithmic or otherwise in the public sector anyway. A very good example that I always like to tell people is that, you know, you're, you're in, again, in North America, you're pulled over by the cop because you're speeding. The cop looks at you and lets you off with a warning. That is human discretion in, in play. Uh, theoretically, the cop should have uh, given you a ticket, but they decided not to and let you off with a warning. That's human discretion. And that discretion is a huge part of how bureaucrats make decisions. And number one thing uh, is algorithmic literacy. <laughs> a lot of these people have no training in, in algorithms. Why should they? That's not what they what their job is. Uh, but now they're increasingly asked to make decisions from numbers, from a probability score, from a risk score, or like something that says high, medium, low risk. What does that even mean, right? So based on all of this, uh, you know, kind of go over this a little bit. Uh, but, you know, we talked a little bit about these three different lenses and, and kind of these outcomes from this work. And so once again, we kind of understood what the socio-technical system is. And then we were really trying to understand what the embeddedness of algorithms are. And this was published at CACW 2021. Uh, this won a couple of awards. Uh, I mentioned that just to, just to mention that my student is on the job market. <laughs> so, you know, I always try to elevate his work. Um, Number three, kind of moving on to that, to the last piece. So again, we've understood the state of algorithms. We've kind of understood from a very theoretical perspective how the algorithms are embedded. The second thing is, well, what, what can we do? How do we improve decision-making in this world where the data is unreliable and we should, you know, we should not be using quantitative uh, collected data at all. And so the first thing that kind of pops out here uh, and I'll direct your attention to this pie chart over here, is that the data that's currently used in algorithms in child welfare is only 15%, around 15% of the entirety of data that exists in child welfare. So uh, most of the data in child welfare is actually text. And uh, these are legally mandated text. Uh, these are almost detailed ethnographic narratives which comprise around 85% of every case. We've actually done this uh, calculation and we've seen uh, again that the algorithms that exist in child welfare systems across North America, they're dependent on only 15% of the overall data that's collected. Uh, again, because the 15% that this data, the checklists and assessment and psychometric assessment, these are easily quantifiable and readily available, kind of going back to that first study. And this is this data is unreliable. It's so like 15% of the data is entirely unreliable. So the question is, are the data that's not the 15%, but the other 85%, this detailed textual data, are they more reliable? And from the previous study, we actually found uh, that the caseworkers' uh, narrative data is more reliable. Like the caseworkers actually make a huge distinction between the narrative data and this assessment data that they collect. Uh, the way that it was explained to me was that, you know, we have to do, we have to manipulate the data to get more money for the child. So we know that that data is nonsense, but there should be a true record of what's actually happening. And that's that they put in these narratives. Um, and they think about the narratives as an archive, like as a, as a archive of true record uh, that, that exists. And uh, before I kind of jump it into the picture, they'd actually never thought that, um, anyone could analyze, you know, decades worth of child welfare notes and all that. So now, um, you know, and, and so these are some of the different types of data that are present in text that are not present, that cannot be present in the structured data. And this is the kind of uh, uh, data that's important. So what are the circumstances, uncertainties, interactions, 
family support, so on and so forth. That's the data that we want if we want to make good predictions in child welfare. So uh, what we wanted to do, we wanted to do a small study uh, kind of looking at some of these case narratives. And um, we decided to do some exploratory topic modeling. And so, uh, you know, what we, we kind of, we've since done more work on this. I'm kind of talking about one paper, but we've since done more work on this. But essentially, uh, we, we trained an unsupervised LDA model on a bunch of these case narratives. Uh, we not only interpreted the topics ourselves, but then I'm a researcher in child welfare. What do I really know about the lived experience in child welfare? So we actually worked with the case workers, kind of thinking about participatory aspects, aspects a little bit. We worked with the case workers and the supervisors in the system to get their interpretation of what the underlying bubbled up topics actually were. We found a final topic model solution of 17 topics. Um, it's actually really interesting. I want to talk about it a little bit. So you can take these 17 topics down and you can further do thematic analysis on them and reduce them, further reduce their dimension down to like six broad topics out of the, or six broad themes out of the 17 topics. And what's really interesting is, you know, four out of the six topics we already knew about because, you know, we've done a deep ethnographic work with child welfare systems. So we already know about some of these topics. What we didn't know were the ones outlined in red. We never actually saw uh, these kind of things come up in the ethnography, primarily because we were conducting the ethnography in the office. And this is the kind of stuff that happens out in the field. And so this is interesting because it points to how we kind of need to do complementary work. One critique of responsible AI is people don't do qualitative, the, the first detailed qualitative work that is necessary to understand the system. So we did that and we realized that that helped us un answer like 80% of the questions that we had, but then that was not enough. It was actually from the analysis of the narratives that we actually found a, a few more things that were, that were interesting that the ethnography didn't have. So again, kind of points to how, you know, we should be approaching things from multiple perspectives. One method, one approach, one framework is not enough. So, uh, you know, we divided the families into those with low, medium, high needs based on, you know, what the child welfare system usually does. It's kind of based on number of interactions that they have. So the idea is that if you're a family with more interactions, then, you know, you have higher needs. I and mean, this is a very typical way to do this. Uh, and so we wanted to look at uh, the narrative patterns over time. So are there certain things that we can find? And... Uh, so this is kind of like one of the observations. So you can, you know, we kind of normalize the life of a case. And then we were kind of looking at topic probabilities over time. And there's a few things that we can, you know, we can see that, okay, well, we can see that during certain period, the parents have to do parenting classes, right? And so you can see that those kind of observations do pop up. The topics do become popular based on the life of the case, based on what that particular topic is. Okay, well, that's interesting. So you can actually start to get at some of these things. Uh, then, for instance, you can, you know, they're like parenting assessments that are conducted, but they're conducted semi-frequently, right, at certain points of time. And you can see that, okay, well, that, those popularities coming up. Uh, again, same thing with home safety. So you can see that based on what the topic is, if you look at particular cases, you can actually see where they kind of bubble up. So that's giving us more information about these kind of critical decision-making criteria. The second thing that we want to do, this was kind of borrowed from prior work that Antoniak and Minno had done, is we want to do like computational power analysis. So there's lots of stakeholders in child welfare. How do we kind of look at who, you know, like day-to-day -day power relationships from the text? And that's, I, I thought, was very important. Uh, we kind of took the first uh, six because those were the ones that, that were mostly there. And, um, you know, this is kind of like an explanation of the actual NLP that's done, but essentially it kind of depends on the power that are in certain verbs. Again, this is in English. Uh, it's going to be different for different languages. Um, and, and so you can see some, some examples about how the, the power analysis work. It kind of depends on nouns and verbs and, you know, like SAP came up with this in 2017. This was further improved by Antoniak and Mimno in 2019. Um, 
And so based on all a lot of this, we can actually see these kind of different power relationships. For instance, in group one, low needs, this is at-home placement. You can actually see based on at-home placement, the biological parent actually holds the most power, as they should. These are not children who are removed from their parents' home, right? These are at-home placements, so children who are still placed with their birth parents. Uh, but you can see different things for, for different groups. If you look at the medium need groups, you'll see, oh, this has changed. Now you can see that foster parents actually exercise most, most power. And group two is short-term foster parents. So like one week, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, uh, this is what it is. So the caseworkers have to kind of maintain good relationships with the foster parents who are kind of just like, uh, you know, taking care of the child on a short-term basis, right? And then if you look at group two, you see the patterns are different. Uh, again, foster parents do exercise most power, but this is long-term foster parents. And this kind of points to uh, a, a lot of things. You know, you can see that biological parents, foster parents are not that different. And it's because, again, there's some misconceptions here, but it's like, if your child is placed in foster home, it, ought, it doesn't mean that you never see the child ever again. That's not what that means. In fact, the state wants permanency. The state wants reunification. That is the goal. And so there's a, there's a lot of kind of these collaborative things that kind of come up, right? Like uh, it, it kind of, pushes back at some of the popular narratives that, uh, you know, birth parents have no control and no power and no agency in child welfare. I mean, in a sense, that's true. But in a sense, that's also not true. It's a little bit more complicated than that, right? So kind of taking all of this into account, um, you know, we can, see, we can see a few things, right? So we focused on computational narrative analysis to highlight the, the patterns of invisible work and labor and relationships and events that kind of come up through this analysis that you'll never get through assessments, which are the norm right now. And when you kind of throw this over time, over a life of the case, you can actually see, you can actually start to think about where some of these events might occur, right? So this was an unsupervised uh, uh, machine learning approach, but you know, it was kind of one step to thinking about well, how, how can we be more human-centered in improving these decision-making practices? And finally, the computational power analysis showed that you know, the day-to-day, -day, this is not structural power, by the way. This is, I, I should mention that limitation. None of this is, it talks about structural power. That's not something that will ever be solved by algorithm. This is day-to-day -day power relationships, which is different than structural power. So uh, we can highlight those to kind of think about, okay, where should, where might resources go to, where might different stakeholders need different kinds of support. And so that was published uh, this year at CHI 2022. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about ongoing work and then I'll come back to the human Center data science framework. Um, you know, since then we've been doing a whole bunch of things. Like we've actually improved, you know, we've moved on from an unsupervised world to a semi-supervised and now a supervised world. Uh, we've, this is stuff that I call quantitative deconstruction. Like how do you look at what a system is? We do qualitative deconstruction through ethnography, kind of to critique the system, but could we do quantitative deconstruction of a system as well as a, as a supplement, complement to qualitative critical computing? Uh, there's a variety of other collaborations, uh, uh, large general field evaluation, so on and so forth that we're doing that I'm happy to talk about. Um, just wanna be cognizant of time. Uh, finally, I wanna get back to this figure, right? And now you'll see that, you know, we've started kind of filling in some of these gaps over here in the figure. Um, and, and you can see that this is work that we've been doing for, for a few years now, right? And all of this is just to kind of get at, you know, how do we kind of address some of these issues? So again, and I think I'm preaching to the choir when it comes to uh, this particular audience, but all of this work will take years and all of this work will be slow and it can be solved by just, you know, uh, without doing critical computing, right? Like an uncritical observation or approach or naive uh, design and development of algorithms is not gonna help anyone, especially in these kinds of like high stakes decision-making environments where, you know, literally children's lives are on the line. Like without irony, I can actually say that. And so we started filling in these gaps to try and understand, and, and still not enough, right? Like we, we're still kind of doing work. There's more stuff that's coming out very soon uh, where we hope that if we fill in this gap, 
uh, we can then, and again, we started working with our partners in Wisconsin. And since Wisconsin, we also moved beyond Wisconsin to working with other uh, state agencies, collaborating with them. Uh, I've been uh, trying to kickstart collaborations here in Ontario. Uh, you know, the Canadian child welfare system also has algorithms and, uh, you know, there's a, there's a very gory and unfortunate history of Canadian child welfare systems and their relationship to the residential school system in Canada, which is, which is horrible. Anyway, so I just wanted to mention this, kind of go come full circle and talk about, okay, well, we came up with this framework where we said, this is the framework that you should do in order to understand more about a system in order to start, you know, filling in the blanks and start really uh, making good contributions. Uh, and, and we've been trying to do that, right? Like this is something that, that generally works. We now know a lot more about algorithms and child welfare. Uh, uh, and in fact, there's a lot of positive things that have happened. Other people have started getting into the field and started working in a variety of different areas, sometimes following uh, this kind of a process. Uh, and then of course, none of this is something that's restricted to child welfare. Like this is stuff that other students have been have been doing. Uh, you know, you can kind of go beyond child welfare to other parts of the public sector. I've got stuff going on uh, with criminal justice systems, with healthcare systems, uh, with you know, I have a new student who's been doing some work in in financial systems in South Asia. So, for instance, in India, the government uh, provides loans to farmers. Unfortunately due to climate change and for a variety of other reasons, oftentimes farmers can't pay back those loans and they commit suicides. Uh, uh, farmer suicides based on non-repayment of loans is a huge problem in India. It's a huge social issue. And a lot of the time these, these loans are given based on algorithms. So you can kind of look at a causal kind of chain between all of that. So our students were doing a whole bunch of other things. I'm always happy for more collaborators. Uh, and I think I'm at 50 minutes, so I'll stop here. Uh, but again, um, lots and lots of collaborators, students uh, have to thank my grants, National Science Foundation, NSERC in Canada, a bunch of other awards, etc. cetera. Uh, but I'm happy to take your questions and chat um, uh, as, as you see fit. Uh, thank you very much.